Hello and welcome to today's tutorial. My name is Joseph. Today we'll be covering message boxes. I'm not going to lie. I got a bit carried away with this one. So, this will be, I'm going to call it slightly advanced, uh, demonstration of how to generate message boxes. Uh, before I get into it, massive thanks to you guys. You're all amazing. Join the Discord. This will be definitely up in the um, Google Drive because it's a bit lengthy in what I've programmed. But I'm going to show you guys what it can do. So let's boot it up to start with and give you a bit of a demo. So this is what I've generated. Now, it looks simple enough, doesn't it? Not so much. So the way I've generated this is it's actually designed that it should be fairly flexible. So let's get into some of the guts. So I can move it, as you can see, and I can close it. Okay, first things first. Let's look at some of the stuff I've done. I've set a font. I'll show you guys how to call those fonts and insert them. I've got the object as we know, the room. It's just the room, nothing fancy in there. And then the sprites, I've got basically the border and then the buttons I've generated, which is the what we call the hamburger and the exit button. Okay, let's get into the create function first of all. So what I've done in here... Oh, I did it again. Come back on here. So what I've done in here is I've generated what we call a multi-level array. I'll get into that in a second though. So we've got a mouse click. Um, I'm just calling the font function. I call the sprites. I've got a message uh, string selector which indicates which one to select. So what I mean by that is if I go one and run this, you're just going to see I get test, 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 test. So what this does is this lets you actually select out of what strings you want to display what text. So the way this works in a multi-dimensional array, so we should all be relatively familiar with arrays, in a multi-dimensional we have basically a series of inputs. So we have our um, let's say our range zero will equal the entry of of the array um, that you're selecting so the basic idea here is my array is selected by zero which means i'm calling this block of array functions and then as my secondary or my second dimension of my array will then look at zero one two three four which means I can then set another entry at entry one with another set of repeating values. So it means I can use these two to then involve a deeper sense of the array, which means there's less stuffing around. Uh, if you want just a tutorial on this, ask, um, and I'll see what I can do. Because from what I read of the documentation, apparently, and I don't know how this works, but apparently that is a thing that you can do in Game Maker where you can do multiple dimensional arrays in that sense. How would we search for that? I've got a rough idea, but it's still a bit mm, confusing. Okay, let's get into the nightmare side. So, this, which I am definitely not going to get enough screen space for, and even if I enlarge it, this is the message function. So as you can see up here, I have a whole lot of um, temporary values. And these are all very important and useful. So I set a string. Um, I set a string y. I set a, basically a string height increment. I set string sprites, I set a whole bunch of information. I'm just going to run you through it. Like I said, this is up in the Google Drive because it is a little bit complicated. So the string height, oh sorry, starting y, sorry, not string height. Uh, starting y is purely for dictating when to increment the text height. So these two values play with each other, basically. So this is my increment value of 16 pixels. And then this is my starting point for increment. Pretty straightforward. My next is I store my sprite height and sprite width. 
in here because I actually have to use it, as you can see, as we trail down to calculate where positioning should go. Uh, my string width and height by um, this lets me basically calculate the four points of my square I'm drawing. So this is done by hand. So if I want to have a bigger message box, if I said it's 600 pixels, it will be bigger. And you will notice that this text doesn't jump up. That's because to do that is a very painful prospect because you have to search the array, check your longest inference, and then ch check for spacing, stuff like that. It's easier to do it by hand. The next step is my height. Now the height was a pain in the ass. So the height string basically looks at my um, increment, which is 16. So if I modify that, it will modify this. Multiplied by array length 2D, which I can use. So I reference my string and my, my mm, selector, my string selector, which then tells it which entry to go into. So what that's effectively doing in our array is it's not reading this first entry, it's reading the second and working out how many there are and multiplying my height increment. So that should give me what's a multiple of um, five, five sixteens. So it should be something along the lines of 80. And then from there, I've got my um, temp sprite height, which is the height of my sprite. So that is 94. So that brings it up to 174, and then I add 32 as an error, just to add a bit of depth. So that gives me 206. So, like I said, it's a bit complicated, but it will make sense on the way it all works. Um, the temp message box background adjust adjusts in here the inferences here. So if I go and set this to zero, what this is going to do is completely destroy it. One. It's a multiple multiplication factor, so one is important. So one comes out here, and then basically to adjust, I can go four, for example, which will bring it further in, stuff like that. So pretty straightforward. Color is color. I shouldn't have to explain it. Okay, so let's get into the guts of the program a little bit here. Like I said, she's a bit complicated. I'm apologizing multiple times for this. So I draw a rectangle. I reference the width of the sprite. I then take the adjustments I need to take to correctly position. The same thing again. Well, same thing again here. So I'm just taking the same kind of values to position. So this is the adjustment of the... Um, angles as well I should highlight. So those there basically take our sprite width and then our inference value to make it smaller and adjust it. So basically this is the top right, oh sorry, top left hand corner and this will be the top, uh, bottom right hand corner. So this basically does the same thing. So it pulls the same values as you can see, she's lengthy um, and sets the two bottom points in your text square. As I keep going down, and you can see the same inference values. The next thing I have is my message color, which is pretty stock standard. I have to repeat it twice, and I set it to false. So, next step, we draw the sprite borders. So this is just drawing the four borders, and I've divided it in, this is the height, uh, sorry, this is the top two, and this is the bottom two. So this draws the top two corners. And basically, again, you can see I just referen keep referencing these values. Then I use a sprite stretch. So I take my sprite that I'm using for the middle part. So if I reload the program, you'll see what I mean. So it's drawing this here and this here. And then it's stretching it over and effectively putting it in the correct position. So again, each of these calculations are being run to adjust correctly. Uh, the next part here is the same thing. So this is the two bottoms. And then it's doing the same thing again is I'm stretching the sprites over to the correct position. Now, you would think with this massively complicated system that it's hard to draw the text. It's really not. This literally 
is the only component that handles the text draw. I'll explain it a little bit because again, it's using a two dimensional check instead of a one dimensional for the array. So what I do is I run my standard for loop, but instead I run a two dimensional, I reference my array and then I reference my selector, which tells it which effective bucket to reference. I then set the color to black. I then draw or set the font and then I draw text. The text is drawn in this manner, so the thing that's a bit different here is when I draw a two-dimensional array text, I reference my array entry, my array selector, and then I drags out everything else in there using the array length value I've pulled. The next last step is I take my string starting y plus equals my increment number, so it just drops it down. Okay, the next step. We're not quite done yet, folks we need the buttons. So the buttons are again the same principle as above because there is a lot of calculations that go on in this program um, that effectively recalculate it and then uh, work out where these buttons should live. So the first step is I pull all my values up the top there. I'll let you guys read through them. I'm not going to read it through otherwise this tutorial will be hours long. Um, it's basically a button width, button height position, so that just works out at uh, button height and width because we continuously reference it. I've got an adjust value. These here are what I call a throwaway value. These get rewritten again down below and readjusted based on what I'm using them for. So it's one of the reasons I use these temp values because they're effectively a throwaway and I can continuously regenerate them with new information. Think of them as running values in a way. Uh, next step is I draw the sprite and again you can see I'm quite literally just referencing the positional value to work out where it should live. Next step is I run a... Now, just as a note, this isn't using an ID check to work out where the button click is. It's using a distance check with a mouse click. Not 100% ideal but works for what I'm trying to achieve. So basically I do a distance check based on the position of the center of the icon or the image above. And if the mouse is within that position, it activates the click. Now you'll notice here, I'm actually taking the sprite button width and sprite button height and dividing by four. That is important. So I'm trying to find the center of my sprite, but if I don't know my width and height, so if you want to use an odd shape, this should calculate roughly the center of it. Dividing by four should work that out because I'm adding the two, effectively taking the average and then dividing it again, in essence. Um, if it breaks down, just go divide two, bracket, bracket, divide two. Plain and simple. Uh, the next step is my mouse button click, press left. I then basically engage my click function and hold it. My, if my click function is enabled, I take my x is equal to mouse minus the temp button position. Super important. If you don't do this, and I will show you if you don't do this, this is what happens if you don't add that extra bit of coding. It's going to jump to the original x point. So I'm changing the reference point of the object. That's what that does. So it basically changes the reference back to where the button should be. And then if I release my button, it resets. The last step of this whole program is my remove the message box. And you'll see now what I was talking about, see how I've changed some of the values in here and it gets readjusted. And that allows me to place the new button function. So you can see that X, I can close it. So let's say I'm, I'm just going to quickly show you just the power of this. So let's go like this. Let's add a bunch of extras. So normally in most programs would have to manually adjust a lot of this. The reason for this complexity, and it has an important reason, is it means I can do stuff like this and I'll change my selector value. And when I run this, you can see it, it adds dynamically all of these. So I don't need to go and manually adjust. Like, look, look, the worst thing here is I'd have to manually adjust this. So if I was gonna be mega lazy, 
I could do this here. And I'll just show you guys what I mean. So if I wanted to adjust, now obviously this will run into issues. But if I dump a bunch of these there, you'll see it dynamically generates them. So that's the power of this message box. Yes, it's complicated, but it's it's worth that kind of flexibility because it means it makes you less work when you're going into your workflow. So I hope this tutorial helped. I know it's complicated and I apologize for that. If you would like me to generate a scroll function as well for this, that is possible. I have allowed the flexibility in the program to do that. Um, other than that though, massive thank you, you guys. You're all awesome. You have no idea. I still astounded by the amount of people that follow me on YouTube. That's ridiculous in my opinion. Anyway, I will talk to you guys later. This will be up on the Google Drive and jump onto the Discord if you guys feel like it. I will talk to you guys later. See us.